Scott, and he is from the Yamaguchi University in Japan. And uh, he was there when there was a tsunami in 2011, and so he's been talking about some bioremediation. Uh, currently, he is a visiting professor at Berkeley, and so he was kind enough to come up for the day and give this presentation to us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I am Azizul Moksod currently visiting scholar in the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in University of California, Berkeley. And um, at first, I would like to thank all of you for attending to this con uh, talk. And today, I'm going to talk about some like first-hand experience of a tsunami in, to, in Japan in 2011. So, and in the later part of my presentation, I will show some uh, of my researches like bioremediation, of uh, tsunami affected soil. So at the end of my presentation, you can come to know some how to clean soil by using some uh, bacteria. So before going to my main presentation, I would uh, like to introduce uh, some of my background or research or why did I choose this research. So if you look at the current state of the world, the people's lifestyle, like more than 60% of the world population live less than $2 per day. So this is very much a sad fact, but wherever they live, whether they live in Africa or in Asia or in North America, they have some common characteristics of their lifestyle, like they don't have enough food, they don't have good shelter, they don't have safe water to drink, and they don't have enough electricity or energy, and like they don't have good sanitation or good environment or good transportation. And the most important thing, they are affected by the natural disaster most. So if we want to change the lifestyle of these people, or if we want to change the world as a whole, if you think very carefully that we are the responsible persons, that civil engineers have the most responsibilities to improve this condition. For example, like number two, they don't have food shelter, and they don't have safe water to drink or enough energy or like good environment uh, to protect the people from the natural disaster. The civil engineers have the most responsibility to improve this condition. So from that perspective, I chose like, how can I do something to give the enough, uh, at least some energy or alternate energy to the people of the, this type of thing and, and global uh, community as, as well. And also I sometimes, we cannot do anything for, uh, with the natural disaster. So what we can do, we have to like uh, make something that that will give some ease to the affected people or uh, affected area, and try to protect the people from the natural disaster. So most of my research teams are from from this perspective or from this background. Let's see what is the condition of the uh, world energy. Like this is the uh, one uh, uh, very famous photo from NASA, the world at night. So like 25% of the total population live in the dark at night. So like 1.6 billion people, they don't have enough electricity. So, and this is one of the reasons why they are not doing good. So they need energy, even a small amount to, for example, lead on a little light so that they can study at night, the children can study at night and improve their condition. So this is one of the reasons why I choose my research in that way. And here is the uh, themes or major research interest of mine, what I'm doing in uh, the Yamaguchi University in Japan. Like number one, in sediment microbial fuel cell to remediate the sulfide contaminated tidal geo environment. So this is one uh, new technology to improve the contaminated uh, land area to put some um, microbial fuel cell. So the benefit of this is that both we can clean the sediment and also can get the, some bioelectricity. So this electricity can be used to power the environmental monitoring sensors. And then number two is that like plant microbial fuel cell to get bioelectricity from the living plants. So the mechanism is that when the sunlight uh, comes to the 
green leaves and then green leaves produce some carbohydrate and the excess amount of carbohydrate they goes to the root zone and then the geobacteria they try to eat or break down that uh, carbohydrate and at that time they release some electron and we put some anode and cathode some external circuit to catch that electron so this is the way to get the bioelectricity from the living plants and why it is important because this is very much clean source of energy and of course this is sustainable because no uh, food harvest like other biofuels like you know, biodiesel or something we use corn or soybean to make some transportation fuel but it may never be sustainable because a lot of people are still hungry all over the world so we must think we must uh, try to get some energy by energy which is both we can get the food and also can get the energy so this plant microbial uh, fuel cell is one of the very good example of that and because here only the source of uh, the energy is sunlight so something like biological um, our biological solar cell you can say and we tried it with some different kinds of plants there is one rice plant because in japan like 50% of the land area uh, agricultural land area they used to produce the rice and not only in japan many parts of the asia those need also energy and also food so they can and they produce lot of rice there as main food so they can uh, get the energy or electricity from their rice field and at the same time they can also harvest the rice so that is uh, one of my researches here and then um, the number three is like bioremediation of saline soil caused by the tsunami and using foam dust plus and bacteria so today i will go detail of this number three theme so i'm just stick here and Number four is the bioelectricity generation from organic waste mixing with soil. So organic uh, soil can also produce the electricity. And um, here in Berkeley, I'm doing focusing this thing and the, from the plant microbial fuel cell to produce some electricity, and so that I can power some sensors for environmental monitoring sensors or infrastructure monitoring sensors. So, and the, finally, the biogeotechnical engineering to make the land little bit uh, environment friendly way not to use the uh, cement as the uh, improvement method so we use some bacteria to make the soil against the liquefaction when earthquake happens and also to protect the slope so these mainly five things i am uh, conducting in my uh, research uh, lab in back to Japan and also some of the things are doing in here in Berkeley as well. So today I'm mainly focusing number three, okay? So what is that actually? So the mega earthquake, that magnitude is 9.0. So it happened on March 11, in 2011. And the total damage is like 360 billion USD. So according to the uh, like amount of loss this is the largest one of the largest natural disasters in all whole history of the civilization so and it was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded to hit in japan okay japan has a lot of earthquakes because surroundings there are a lot of um, tectonic plates but that was the highest so far recorded and this earthquake triggered a powerful tsunami, so the highest reached about 40 meters, like 133 feet. So it's huge, and it was so devastating that, like, unfortunately, 15,000 people died, or six, uh, uh, and then 2,000 people are still missing, and like 100 or 27,000 buildings collapsed. Normally, earthquake did not collapse the house in Japan because they are very much um, I mean technologically advanced against the earthquake most of the houses collapsed or the or like half collapsed is due to the tsunami so due to the earthquake they have some liquefaction somewhere and after the tsunami came 
the most of the foundation failure or superstructure failure happen and due to the uh, mainly tsunamis and some heavy damage to the roads and railways and some also fires in many areas and one dam collapsed so let's see one video of the tsunami You can see the tsunami is approaching, so it was so much powerful that it washed all the houses and all the things on its way. <coughs> this is uh, in Tohoku, Iwate Prefecture, and the city name was Rikuzen Takata. They had beautiful sea beach and also like uh, pine trees but all of them are just devastated very within a minute and then what happened after that tsunami the drive into Rikuzen Takata is bad enough the detritus of a place of 24,000 souls scattered along the roadside okay. and then you, you see the town see itself it was a town. except it's not the a town city. not anymore but on a sunny Friday afternoon, the tsunami powered relentlessly up this valley on the some tsunami 10 debris. kilometers. Almost nothing so in its path survived. People do not say this Rescue is workers west, say okay. just 6,000 people are known to have gone out in time. 18,000 uh, still unaccounted for. As the residents of Rizuka and Takata would have driven into town on their daily errands, they would have driven past rice paddies here, so driven past houses which are now just piles of wood. Their everyday, permanent, it seemed, fixtures of life have just gone in an instant, along with countless lives. And the first challenge for the disaster didn't discriminate. A iron railway bridge twisted and broken like west. wire. Cars tossed and smashed. Usually unobtrusive trappings of modern life, suddenly hideously out of place. On higher ground, we find Masahiro Uwabe looking out over his birthplace. A shopkeeper, he made it onto the roof of his three-story building and watched the tsunami so he rage was one of the shopkeepers there. The houses were swallowed up by the wave, and then they started floating past. As the away. buildings were destroyed, black dusty smoke was thrown up, and then the tsunami swallowed up the smoke as well. There is a large-scale relief effort going on up and down this coast, but there's little they can do beyond clear roads look for bodies here. At first I thought almost everyone was dead, but gradually I found my family and friends alive. I began to hope maybe half of the missing had survived. Even that hope would leave 9,000 dead. The scale of that tragedy laid out along the valley, but it's clearer still in the little things left behind. A life preserver, futile against such a life taker. A letter opened and kept, never to be read again. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, Rikuzen Takata, Japan. So, that was the tsunami. I mean, how much devastating it was. And it was the, like one photo when just topple of the seawall. Here, there was like 30 meters or like 24 meters seawall surrounded. But even though the tsunami water toppled this one and reached into the city, And you can see, while approaching to the uh, inside the inland, it just washed away all the things, like all the houses, trees. Those are like those trees are like uh, green protection for the uh, for the tsunami. But initially, it was survived. But after the second wave, that all of them just washed away. And this is the situation of the streets at the time. And that guy was one uh, uh, like a photographer of the local newspaper, but later he survived from this situation. And just after the tsunami, th this was the thing what happened to the entire city. So most of the like uh, one-story building are just washed away. Only the few of the concrete building they survived. And this is the situation like how to deal with that after the tsunami when the how to clear this debris because many of the parts are like not accessible due to the collapse of the uh, transportation system.
this is one uh, famous photo of the tsunami one superstructure is floating inside the